Hello and welcome to this Nordic Tech webinar. Today we'll be talking about Nordic's Bluetooth LE solution and why and how it became the go-to choice for developers. My name is Paweł Kanafek, I'm product marketing engineer and I will run the presentation. Then together with our expert Eric Mitton, uh, who is technical product manager for Bluetooth portfolio, will be answering your questions. Bluetooth Low Energy is a relatively new standard, but Nordic has been gaining expertise in ultra low power ICs design long before that. Nordic has its roots in 1983, starting as a design house for custom ASICs. Later on, around the year 2000, we started with a series of products for ultra low power wireless communication based on 2.4 GHz proprietary protocols. Then, around the year 2006, we joined Wibri project led by Nokia and co-developed it until it was adopted as Bluetooth Low Energy within Bluetooth 4.0 specification. And we are contributing to development of Bluetooth standards ever since. Since the release of the first products for Bluetooth LE, we have seen an explosion of demand for Nordic products and we have been gaining increasing market share in Bluetooth Low Energy. We measure our market share based on qualified end products. So we take Bluetooth SIG listings, which take all products that go to market and check against this. Over the last five years, we've covered over 40% of all qualified products, which is more than three times as much as the second best. In terms of volume, on average, we manufacture 2 million socks a day. We've already delivered billions in total to thousands of different customers. These numbers, especially number of projects and customers, serve as a very good feedback basis to build upon. We also support all kinds of customers from startups and small companies up to global enterprises. We've reached this position, as we believe, because of the approach that we've taken to providing the complete solution for Bluetooth Low Energy. We hear from our customers that their pressure on time to market is increasing. Therefore, we focus on providing a complete solution to cover most of components that go into the end product. The, fo the foundation, of course, is hardware, uh, SOCs for Bluetooth Low Energy that we started with, but we also invest a lot in the development of stack, comprehensive SDK, development tools, and resources for mobile applications development. We also provide world-class support with educational resources on Dev Academy, with responsive technical support available through DevZone, where you can ask any questions to our support engineers. And we also host Nordic Tech webinars and Nordic Tech Tour. Also, our partner programs are growing. And now it's easier than ever to find a competent partner for those who want to outsource R&D. All these items contribute to the quality of your end products. And having this many ready-made components enabled getting to market as fast as possible. Before wrapping the intro, let me share a few reasons why engineers choose Nordic. And this information is based on feedback from our customers. First is the strong portfolio of high-quality multi-protocol SOCs that cover a wide range of end product requirements. Second is the interoperability. The smooth interaction of Bluetooth devices with mobile phones is the key to achieving a good user experience and satisfaction of end customers. Our customers also value high performance and ultra low power capabilities included concurrently in our products. And last but not least uh, is the developer oriented approach that I already mentioned, but I need to talk a bit more about it. So we invest massively in developing of software components compatible with our chips, as well as in development tools and other software resources. The majority of software that we provide is publicly available on GitHub and development tools are free. Also, technical support is available to all engineers, no matter the size of the project that you're working on.
A few examples of our customer statements. Anker Innovation valued Nordic in their wireless microphone design for the excellent balance of size, performance and power consumption. Casio was mostly focused on battery life as it was extremely important for this project to extend battery life to maximum. And Foxconn Interconnect technology while creating Zion e-bike HMI system needed very responsive support engineers. So from now on we'll continue with the order that I presented in the complete solution and go through all the components of, of it one by one. We'll start from multi-protocol SOCs, the hardware. So uh, right now we have two series in production ready to be used in your projects right away and these are NRF52 series and NRF53 series. All parts from this offering are, are ultra low power and provide efficient processing. These are also qualified for Bluetooth 5.4. These support Bluetooth Low Energy, some support Bluetooth Mesh with Network Lighting Control and NRF53 series support LE Audio. We have a selection of 8 socks that differ in properties, size, memory options and so on. So we have cost effective and feature rich options. Each of these SOCs have at least two package options, one very compact and a larger one. Uh, here you can see a few examples of products that were released last year and all these are based either on 52 or 53 series. This is a broad range of products that differ a lot and it's enabled by a wide range of capabilities provided by different parts. Let's take a look at processing and memory uh, available in these parts. So 52 series are equipped with ARM Cortex M4 running at 64 MHz. Larger parts have FPU option enabled. We also have a variety of flash and RAM sizes in these parts, so it brings a possibility to scale your project. We recommend to start early development on a chip with a larger memory and scale down if possible. Another uh, 53 series is actually uh, only one SOC. It's NRF 5340 and because after releasing it we've decided to shift the R&D effort on 54 series entirely and that's why we have only one here. NRF 5340 is a dual core chip, so we have two ARM Cortex M33 there. Application core has both DSP and FPU enabled, and it supports voltage frequency scaling. It can run either on 128 or 64 MHz. Radio core runs at 64 MHz. It is equipped with a decent amount of memory. So processing uh, within Bluetooth SOC needs to be very efficient to achieve long battery life, and etc. In this slide, you see on the vertical axis the performance measured in CoreMark and efficiency measured in CoreMark per milliamp on the horizontal one. You can see that uh, 52 series, uh, example of 52840 in the left bottom corner, is slightly less powerful and less efficient uh, because it's on M4. 53 series provides uh, some options. In the top, we see application uh, core running at 128 MHz with the best performance, but at the cost of slightly lower efficiency. But if you clock it down, you can achieve better efficiency at the cost of slight of like half uh, performance. Network core is optimized for for efficiency to achieve the best results. A few details about uh, radio, which of course is a very important part of Bluetooth SOC, and we put a lot of effort into R and D of these. Um, so you can find link budget up to 104 dBms, that's measured for 1 megabit phi and can be even hard, higher with coded this long, long range phi. Uh, some parts have slightly smaller, smaller link budgets, but not much. Uh, we have all three phi supported, uh, 
Some parts don't support long range, but you can pick a part whether you need a long range, high throughput, low latency, but always with a reliable connection for what it's needed for. All socks provide very low power consumption, and I will elaborate on these real life use cases in a moment. Uh, these are multi-protocol chips, cap capable to support multi multiple protocols concurrently. Not all parts support all these protocols, so you need to check when you'll be picking, because some of these uh, don't have enough mem memory to support, to support matter, for example. Um, so comparing power consumption of Bluetooth SOCs isn't a trivial task. Uh, that's because comparing datasheet figures simply isn't enough. Of course, we do our best to keep these numbers as low as possible, because this is the entry point for everything that happens next that we'll look at. But it's not the whole picture. Uh, so we often get questions about these numbers and how do we compare these numbers to other competing SOGs and so on. But this isn't the essence of this problem. Uh, so what you should do is to look at the power consumption for your specific use case. Mm, for that, we have two tools. First, the online power profiler available on our page for free. And here we have a simulation for 52840 within this tool. So let's take a look. Uh, here you see a simulation uh, for condition described in this dashed box in the right bottom. And so you can see that it's not the absolute current in a given state, which is important, but how long it takes, how long, uh, how long it stays in this state, uh, how long it takes the radio to switch between these states and so on. So for this use case, the simulated total average current is five microamps, as you see in the right. If you're happy with uh, what you get from online power profiler, you can take it a step further. And for that, we have a power profiler kit. We sell this tool publicly and you can measure uh, power consumption on any device in a dynamic range uh, from microamps to a full one amp. It's also useful to measure current consumption of the whole system with external components. So uh, for this presentation, my friend took a test exactly for the same use case as simulated on the previous slide. And you can see that we also got a re result very close to five microamps. And the chart that you see, uh, these spikes that you see in this chart uh, are the same communication sequence that was presented in the slide before. NRA52 and 53 come with a selection of peripherals. Uh, of course, larger parts provide more. Smaller parts are very tiny, down to 10 GPIOs and only suit some key peripherals. NRA5340 is a major improvement over 52 series. Uh, apart from more efficient ARM Cortex M33 processor with much better efficiency, it has a redesigned radio which with much lower power consumption. It also supports LE audio. It is equipped with audio PLL, I2C, and PDM interfaces. It supports LC3 codec, and LE audio stack is available in NRF Connect SDK. We provide NRF 5340 audio DK, which is specifically designed for development of audio applications. NRF 5340 also has improvements in terms of security. It is certified for uh, PSA level 2. It has ARM CryptoCell uh, 312 and it supports a secure key storage, root of trust, and provides a separation of trusted and non trusted execution environment with ARM Trust Zone. So we have separation of flash, RAM, GPIOs, and peripherals. Now let's move on to recently announced 54 series. So uh, before going to details, just let you know that within 54 series and by now we have announced one SOC for each of its sub branches. So we have NRF54L series and NRF54H series. 
Currently, we are in the sampling program for this for selected customers and we've sampled to almost 200 customers and many of them already started development. So it's a real thing, but not yet ready enough to be released publicly. Before I'll give you uh, more details, let's focus on some common properties and advancements introduced in general for this next generation. So first of all, we have improved efficiency. This is like providing higher processing performance and lower power consumption at the same time. This was enabled by moving on to 22 nanometer process node. It is a breakthrough in silicon manufacturing for this class of devices, uh, meaning Bluetooth LE and other highly integrated and size optimized components for IoT. We are pioneering the progress to this process node as there aren't Bluetooth chips manufactured in 22 nanometers yet. We manufacture 54 series in global foundries and TSMC to di diversify the supply chain. Security is much improved. These chips are equipped with physical protection and more security features, making this designed for PSA certified level 3. Also, the radio was completely redesigned to this 22 nanometer process node. Therefore, we achieved better performance and lower power consumption. NRF 54 series will support Bluetooth LE, Matter, Thread and Plus, and we have a new option with 4 megabits per second throughput in 2.4 GHz proprietary. So as said before, NRF 54 series has two branches. NRF 54H series is a revolution. It has enough processing power to enable new IoT products that were not possible before to be implemented with a single Bluetooth SoC. That's the key. And uh, it expands our portfolio of products towards the high-end high and advanced solutions. NRF54L series is a next-level multi-protocol SoC. It is a na natural successor of NRF52 series and it's aimed for the next generation of IoT products. NRF54L15 is the first member of NRF54L series. And let's take a look on parameter of it. So um, here we have this fourth generation radio. Uh, it is much improved in terms of range, robustness, and lower power consumption. I can reveal some specifications. We have it in the uh, in the block diagram. So we have 8 dBm maximum TX power and minus 98 dBm sensitivity. Together, it results in 106 dBm link budget. And this is also for one meg phi. Uh, we are not revealing power consumption yet, but I can say that it has improved well. Um, processing power and efficiency is much improved. So we have twice as much processing power and reduced power consumption at the same time. There is one and a half megabytes of NVM, non-volatile memory, and 256 kilobytes of RAM. L15 also has a RISC-V processor on board, which is intended for software peripherals that we'll provide. NRF54 L15 comes in compact package that, and the smallest package is more than 50% smaller than the similarly specced NRF52 840. NRF54 L15 has standard peripherals, but there are some novelties too. So, for example, Global uh, RTC lets you to run RTC in system off that wasn't possible before, and this results in lower sleep currents. There is also a 14 bits ADC from the new peripherals. Uh, similarly to other products, there will be ultra compact package options and a larger option. Let's move on to 54H. So the first member of this series is NRF 54H20. NRF 54H20 is a multi-processor SOC with two ARM Cortex-M33. 
the radio processor first in the left in the block diagram is clocked at 256 MHz and the application processor can wrap up to 320 MHz and it's also equipped with dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. We've run the application processor through uh, the ULP mark core mark benchmark and got an exceptional result. You can find details in the result table in the link, but it is now the leading processor in its class in terms of both processing power and efficiency, and it's uh, even better than the general purpose MCUs. NREL 54H20 exceeds requirements of uh, PSA certified level 3, and it has a record-breaking radio. Uh, so it is the first uh, Bluetooth sock reaching sensitivity of minus 100 dBm. And it's also for 1 meg uh, phi. Uh, it is combined with maximum TX power of 10 dBm, so we have link budget of 110 dBm. It is also equipped with a generous amount of memory with 2 MB of non-volatile and 1 MB of RAM. Uh, NR54H20 integrates components that weren't integrated into a single Bluetooth SOC ever before. Uh, so we have from the left a powerful MCU, ample memory, additional peripherals that we didn't have before, like CAN controller, and of course a Bluetooth SOC that looks like a minor part now compared to the other parts of this system, and a secure element. Uh, so with all these components in one very small package, we believe that it can enable new products that were not possible before. About peripherals, you see some standard peripherals. Uh, I don't have them all listed here, but there is more than in 54L. And we can share them under NDA. Uh, but let's focus on the new peripherals. Uh, there is a global RTC, the same as for NRF54L15. And we have uh, also high-speed USB, i3C, CAN FD controller, and some more that we'll be revealing publicly in the future. So um, let me jump back to 52 and 53 series for a moment. Uh, for all these parts, we have development kits, and these kits come with onboard debugger, most IO pins are accessible, and so on. Uh, you know the concept. And uh, all socks have either a dedicated decay or can be emulated by cutting down on memory and peripherals. We also have an USB dongle, which is useful for testing. It can be used for prototyping of simple products and can be used as a sniffer. We also have a prototyping platforms. Uh, these are more feature packed, built for quick proof of concepts and for makers. These are Thingy52 and Thingy53. Um, before going to software, um, heads up on complementary ICs that we have in the offering. So we have a range of products for power management and range extenders. For example, we have NPM 1300. This is a PIMIC, which combines multiple features together. I'm not going to dig into details today, but the most impressive ones are battery charging. We have a fuel gauge on board of PIMIC and it uses a smart algorithm that runs on a, a chip that it's attached to and it Im improves the reading of battery charge by a lot compared to re just a regular fuel gauge. It also improves uh, the battery life. So. It's a very innovative product. You can give heads up to your fellow hardware designers uh, and see what they say. Uh, front end modules attenuate RF signals so you can achieve longer range or improve reliability of your link. So enough about hardware, let's move on to software now. And let's start from NRF Connect SDK.
Another Connect SDK is a comprehensive set of source code and libraries for Nordic hardware. It contains connectivity stacks, drivers, middleware, security and multiple samples. It is provided with a dedicated IDE, toolchain, development tools and mobile app resources to make development efficient. It includes the Zephyr project to unlock the potential of open source Artos with its vibrant community and ecosystem. It enables you to use Zephyr compatible third party modules, tools and libraries with NRF Connect SDK. Um, next slide. Um, when you look closely at NRF Connect SDK, you will see that it's quite more than a standard Bluetooth stack. Uh, since we contribute a lot to new Bluetooth specifications, we are aware of what's coming and we are able to release new updates for new specifications quite soon after these are adopted. Last year, we've released PA PAWR support, ESL profiles, Bluetooth Mesh 1.1, uh, network lighting control profiles, and so on. So uh, we also provide uh, additional features uh, for some proprietary features of Bluetooth. And as said before, we are known for having the best interoperability. NRF Connect SDK is based on Zephyr. That means that with the SDK, you get small scalable Artos optimized for resource constrained devices. But this isn't just the Artos. We like to say that it has batteries included. So we also get security features, other connectivity stacks, uh, middleware, drivers, samples, etc. Lots of resources that you can use and are compatible with Nordic hardware. Even though Artos is now an integral part of NRF Connect SDK, it is still optimized for ultra low power, as we optimize the lower layers of software to ensure the best performance and lowest possible power consumption with our chips. It is also configurable, so it can be used for a very small and basic applications with minimal memory footprint, as well as for more advanced and demanding applications. NRF Connect SDK is now mature and popular, so we've started with a few years back, providing it first to cellular IoT, but now Bluetooth solution is fully ported to NRF Connect SDK and is commonly used. Uh, it is supported by all NRF52 and 53 uh, devices. So I mentioned some parts of SDK, and but let's take a look at uh, them in a structure. So in NRF Connect SDK, you'll get low level drivers and Bluetooth controller, which is specific and optimized for Nordic SOCs, assuring high performance and low power. Uh, you also get a Bluetooth host, which is from Zephyr project that we contribute to, and it is versatile and has a higher availability of uh, components and compatible libraries. Um, you will get uh, Bluetooth libraries, samples and applications, uh, libraries for standard and proprietary profiles, like Nordic UR service, for example, and you get Zephyr Artos, for resource constrained devices, uh, that is a gateway to Zephyr project ecosystem. And with that, you get lots of middleware libraries, modules and samples that are optional. For example, MCU boot for DFU, Memfold, crypto libraries, fuel gauge, NFT, etc. Fuel gauge is for the PIMIC that I mentioned before that comes from Nordic. So uh, you'll see that there is much more in NRF Connect SDK than it used to be in a simple Bluetooth LE SDK, but there is a good reason for that. Uh, so uh, like 10 years ago, uh, we've had a very basic hardware that allowed to run application, wireless stack and manage some ex external hardware. Uh, this provided, uh, like, this was enough for simple applications running on a single chip, or it required uh, additional uh, general pur purpose MCU aside. Uh, but today we have much more. So Bluetooth LE SOCs uh, are much more capable and they can provide much more functionality. Uh, it's kind of push-pull game, so we can provide better hardware as there is demand for more advanced applications with more features, with wireless stacks in plural, for smart home, for example, uh, we get a remote update 
uh, we get remote diagnostics, we add more advanced security as requirements are increasing and driven by regulators. And we have machine learning, for example, uh, that we didn't think of this 10 years ago. So all this becomes more advanced and it needs to be addressed with more abstraction and decoupling from hardware. And this is to enable reusing software uh, using third party components. And that's necessary because like at this level of requirements, developing software in house simply doesn't scale anymore. And um, I think that we've all seen this trend repeating uh, in the past and it's repeating now uh, with, for example, with PCs that were like scattered and then common platforms appeared uh, with mobile phones, with Android, iOS and so on. And closer to our embedded world, uh, we saw, for example, successfully Yocto project. Uh, so this history just repeats and it's a trend and uh, this is probably what we are seeing in Bluetooth flow energy space right now. We are addressing it by combining our expertise that we've had and developed for years uh, with highly optimized firmware for lower layers, uh, which is optimized for Nordic socks, for peripherals, radio, etc. Uh, we've also ported our very good device controller known for um, a previous SDK and taken its interoperability and performance into an RF Connect SDK. We also provide our own Bluetooth libraries uh, with samples and we qualify the entire NRF Connect SDK with every release. Now it's qualified for Bluetooth 5.4. Adding Zephyr project and Artos adds more scalability. It makes the software more hardware agnostic, meaning that it's easier to port between chips or even wireless technologies. But most importantly, it benefits from synergy of contributors. So you see major players here, including us, of course, uh, who contribute to build the versatile platform uh, for low power wireless connectivity. This together makes NRF Connect SDK. So uh, now we know that Zephyr was the right choice. Uh, it wasn't that vibrant when we entered, but now we see that it is the fastest growing Artos for embedded devices. You can see number of commits, number of contributors and some other statistics. I'm sure that if you don't know this, you'll want to see it with your own eyes. You can go to GitHub and check, but it's kind of really impressive. Um, we often did question, what is the cost of adding Artos? Uh, for that, we've made an experiment. You can read more about this in the DevZone blog post, which is linked in the bottom, but I've taken a few numbers out of it. Uh, so we can see this example and the order of magnitude that we are talking about here. Uh, so this example is for beacon sample that is obviously with Bluetooth stack. And in the table, we have a comparison of the implementation of it with a bare metal approach on NRF5 SDK and NRF Connect SDK based on Zephyr. Uh, so you can see that flash actually decreased. Uh, so this is because the controller and host are more configurable. So we can uh, cut down on some features. And RAM of course increased because we have scheduler and some other kernel components. But it's not a large increase, only four kilobytes. And we see a small increase in average current. It is increased by uh, 800 nanoamps, and this is the absolute value. So with more compute intense application, the re relative significance of these costs in memory and power consumption should decrease. So it's up to you to judge, but it can be considered as a fair price to pay for flexibility that is added like with Zephyr. So uh, NRF Connect SDK is organized in a few repos. 
these are Nordic specific repos, for example, uh, LDK NRF, which is the my main repo uh, containing main West manifest. Also, for example, NRF XLIP, which contains soft device uh, controller and some other parts. And uh, the other, when we also have repos that are downstreamed. Uh, so this is, for example, uh, Zephyr repo, MCU boot repo, and there are a few more. Uh, so when we release NRF Connect SDK, we downstream all these repos and combine them in one package. But when we develop and contribute to Zephyr, for example, we upstream the code. Uh, the documentation is also organized in uh, the way following uh, repo structure. Uh, so you will find the Nordic specific documentation and documentation which is uh, downstreamed from external repos. So they have slightly different look and feel, uh, but I'm just giving you a heads up so you're not surprised with slightly different look uh, of different parts of documentation, but all is in one place and in one documentation portal. Uh, we are launching the new TechDocs documentation portal right now in beta version. It will combine software and hardware documentation in one place and we'll have some additional features like more advanced search and a few more. But uh, now let's circle back to this uh, 10, year, 10 years ago slide and opening slide about the complete solution approach that uh, we've taken and succeeded with. So in this slide, you see how much in terms of software is provided out of the box. So how much of your software is taken care of? And also you see that the majority is provided as a source. So you have your your source code, you can read it, debug through it and so on. Uh, not everything is licensed as uh, open source, but source is provided and uh, available on GitHub. These are the part in purple. Uh, parts in dark blue are provided as binary, which includes the soft device controller. A little note here, uh, there is also a Zephyr controller that you will, may bump into while going through the documentation, uh, but we recommend to use soft device controller as it performs better with Nordic hardware. Um, so with this approach, with this much software provided, you can really focus on the R&D, on uh, your features, on value provided to your customers and uh, take uh, wireless connectivity for granted. Uh, looking at the top of this diagram, there are samples and libraries. So uh, let's take a look at what we provide in these areas. First, let's discuss libraries and samples developed by Nordic. Uh, so the majority of standard GAT profiles are implemented within this repo. Uh, so we have uh, libraries and examples for battery service, CGMS, HID, HRS, and many more. These libraries uh, are usually provided with a sample that showcases this single feature and can be often used as a starting point for product development. Uh, we also provide Nordic proprietary profiles. Uh, for example, LED button service is like a very popular one. Uh, so it is a good starting point for developing your proprietary services. So you'll see how to handle custom characteristics, UIDs and so on. If you just want to push data between two devices, there is the Nordic UART service. Uh, we also have another category of uh, examples. We call them applications, and these are more complex and show a typical use case as a whole. So they usually include a fully integrated uh, software stack and can serve as a more advanced starting point for developing your product. There are a few, for example, NRF desktop that serves as a complete HID keyboard and mouse example, and a few others below. But there are also 
resources and libraries that you get from Zephyr. So, uh, of course, there are generic features like Shadler, memory management, crypto security, and many more. And these features often are provided with sample samples that show how to use them. There are also more libraries and samples for Bluetooth itself. All right, a uh, few words about IDE that we provide for NRF Connect SDK. Uh, so uh, we use VS Code IDE and it is provided with NRF Connect for VS Code extension. We develop it in-house and it's an extensive addition to VS Code. This helps to develop, build, debug and more. Uh, there below I have a note about what to install, but it's best to follow guides uh, on YouTube or the best way is to go to Dev Academy. Uh, NRF Connect VS Code extension pack is equipped with NRF Util, which manages the repos and provides the SDK in one package. Uh, it is also equipped with Kconfig, device tree uh, with visual or CLI interface, terminal, memory explo explorer, toolchain manager, and so on. So if you need more information about it, uh, we have uh, dedicated webinars about ID and we cover the changes and new features in webinars related to new SDK releases. Uh, it's quite easy to start with uh, VS Code when you have uh, the extension installed. Uh, so if you want to run sample, you just go to, oh, sorry, let me play it. Uh, you just go to VS Code, create new application, copy a sample, and here you get a list from of samples that you've downloaded with the specific version of NRF Connect SDK. So you see uh, Zephyr samples and Nordic samples all, all in one place. So it's like very easy to start with that. Um, but the best way to start with Nordic is to go to Developer Academy. Uh, so we've prepared this we've prepared these extensive courses about NRF Connect SDK and Bluetooth Low Energy. Each of these courses takes around a few hours to complete, depending on your like uh, skill level. On average, it takes around like six to eight hours. Uh, so in NRF Connect SDK Fundamentals, we guide you through the installation of SDK, uh, moving around features, uh, setting it up, about Kconfig, about device tree. You will learn about how to set up a basic application, how to manage threads in Zephyr, how to control peripherals, uh, how to use drivers, how to debug, and so on. So it's an extensive set of basic knowledge to kickstart working with NRF Connect SDK. And in Bluetooth, uh, low energy uh, Bluetooth Low Energy Fundamentals, we cover some basics of PLE. So you can refresh your knowledge or learn it. It covers development of simple application and using the desktop tools, mobile applications um, that I will describe in a moment. Uh, in the in the Bluetooth Low Energy Fundamentals, you will also learn how to set up Nordic Sniffer that I will also describe in a moment. Uh, so there is lots of resources, lots of knowledge to learn in a written step-by-step -step guide that you can follow. Uh, we do update it with every release and also there is NRF Connect SDK Intermediate uh, course that will be released soon. But if you don't have time to go through these courses now, uh, it's also a good idea to go to YouTube channel when in much shorter time you'll see how it looks and feels to work with NRF Connect SDK and VS Code. Let's move on to tools. Uh, so NRF Connect Desktop is a cr cr cross-platform uh, set of tools uh, to assist development on NRF devices. So uh, it contains, uh, sorry, it contains and installs tools for software development and general use. And for Bluetooth Low Energy, you'll want to look at Bluetooth Low Energy tool with which is an 
extensive tool for testing any Bluetooth low energy project. It contains multiple Bluetooth features. Uh, so with a DK connected to your PC, you can interact with uh, another Bluetooth low energy devices. There is also a power profiler, which I showed you before with uh, this power consumption example, and it is compatible. This is the tool to be used with uh, PPK2 hardware. There is RSSI viewer, serial terminal and direct test mode, which is a tool for running Bluetooth radio tests. It's the typical tool used for qualifying hardware design. There is also a programmer to download hex files to devices with bootloader. Um, NRF Connect for desktop is multi-platform. It runs on Windows, Macs and Linux. Linux. And when you connect devices to this tool, it will automatically detect it, download necessary firmware if it's needed and so on. So like, it's a like very cool set of tools for Bluetooth Low Energy. But we also have a sniffer and I will stay here for a moment because it's a very appreciated app that we provide. It runs on a few selected uh, Nordic DKs. Uh, it, is, it uses Wireshark and it's available for free when you have Nordic DK. Uh, it's a quite feature complete sniffer that is widely used and often uh, it's often enough for development needs, especially if you consider its price. Uh, so mobile applications is the last component of our ecosystem that I will be presenting today. With a mobile application, uh, we follow the similar cat categorization of components as for NRF Connect SDK. Uh, so we have libraries that are open source, and this is a set of libraries for Bluetooth, uh, for DFU, for example, for device management, etc. Uh, then we have sample apps that present these libraries in action, and all these sample apps are open source. Uh, so can be used as a starting point for development of your own applications. And the last category is tools that are closed source. So uh, you will find the resources for mobile applications on uh, GitHub and applications are released to Google Play and Apple Store. First application I'd like to show is NRF Blinky, very popular app with very basic functionality. It's a kind of hello world uh, for a complete setup with Bluetooth LE device and mobile application. NRF Blinky shows how to use a BLE library. BLE library is provided for both Android and iOS, and it's a wrapper around the native APIs to unify working with Nordic devices. And it aligns it also closer to APIs that we provide on devices. So with NRF Blinky, you'll be able to use LED button service, the proprietary service that I mentioned before, and it's often used as a starting point to have a project with a proprietary service and when, when you need an app for that. Then we have uh, NRF Toolbox. It is a more advanced sample app for BLE library. As you can see in these uh, screenshots, it provides more features and supports standard Bluetooth services, but also proprietary services. Uh, there is some visualization features if you need it, and it supports Nordic UART service. But the most popular app that we have is NRF Connect for mobile. Uh, you can see how many downloads and how good reviews it got on Google, Google Play. It is a tool, so we don't provide source code for it. It provides extensive range of features on Bluetooth devices. That's discovering, connecting, advertising, and so on. It can be used for testing. And it has a cool feature called macros, so you can record methods called on the mobile phone and then play them with one click. Uh, you just need to get into details of it to, to get it fully. Uh, I won't be explaining this in details today, but it is a very useful and widely used feature. There are There is also RSSI viewer and a few more features, but you need to explore. Uh, so, 
And let me summarize by circling back to the complete solution slide. Because I hope I managed to present the components of this solution that we provide, that you got what's it, what it's about and what value it brings. And I hope that you'll remember mostly from this webinar is the extensiveness and completeness of Nordic Blue Valley solution. And if you're curious about more details, Dev Academy is the place to start. Uh, hi, Eric, are you online? I'm here. All right, very good. So let's go for the questions. Um, so uh, the first one is about true wireless, true wireless stereo. stereo. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Want to take it? Yes. Uh, we're also curious, uh, but uh, we have implemented your wireless stereo on our audio DK and uh, demonstrated on several events. Um, and we're able to receive from phones that support the, this technology. Uh, we also demonstrated Oracast on 5340 and used it at the Bluetooth SIG events. So and that uh, is kind of a true wireless area use cases on the transmitter side. So, so we have everything ready. Um, maybe one drawback uh, for at least for consumer goods is that we, the company that has uh, uh, only Bluetooth LE uh, and at least for headset and earbuds, um, you will likely require um, the dual mode for sometimes to support both classic and LE audio. I think for specialized equipment and sort of new new products where you need uh, benefits on R53, then uh, yeah, I think that's a very good choice for for the radio components. Yeah, and uh, LD Audio introduces like the addresses through wireless stereo by default, right? With uh... correct, uh, correct. I mean, most uh, I think it's technically po possible to, to manage it uh, with classic audio, but I think it's only, to my knowledge, it's only Sony had done it. All, all other companies transmit like point to point to, for example, earbuds. They transmit to the typically right earbud, and then they have a magnetic res resonance between the two earbuds. While on um, Bluetooth or LE audio, you actually have a direct connection with the two earbuds, and if you lose connection with one, you still can stream to the other one. So that's, yeah, and, uh, and there is that uh, coordinated set profile, and yeah, this problem is will be solved with in LE audio. So, oh no, it is it is solved and it, it works, and we have demonstrated it. So so yeah. it works really well. It's just about when products maker will pick it up and start launching products. We actually, oh, we have we have customers working on this already, but we cannot comment on it. But uh, we. But it, it's happening, and it's uh, we see more and more phones uh, coming up, rolling out support for this. So it, it's exciting. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, so about uh, Anchor, did they use the audio functionality or on an R53? Mm, so uh, we we cannot discuss like very deep uh, technical details of like products that our customers work on. I can but, comment a few things yeah. that are public, yes. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's do that. So uh, we have a we have a press release uh, that maybe we can share it in the, in the chat later, but there, there is a press release on, on this from Lordic side. Uh, and it does say that it used LC3 plus codec. So uh, LC3 plus has some extra features that you won't find in the standard LC3. So they are kind of, kind of using some extras that is not in LE audio. So it, it is a bit more that, that we know. Um, and if you look at the product page, there is a um, adapter dongle. So uh, they kind of assume that most phones will not have LE audio for a while, but still want to sell it. So, so there is an adapter. And on this iPhone 13 comment, um, I mean, we, that's also some, nothing we can comment on and probably won't know before it's launched uh, for the support. But it is um, for iPhone 13, that's when it switched from uh, Bluetooth, uh, Apple switched from Bluetooth 5.0 to 5.3. So uh, on the lower layers of the chip in the phone, yes, that, that's from that's where it, they can technically introduce LE audio. Uh, Isochronous channels, which is kind of the base feature in, in the controller, is, that was a uh, 5.2 feature. But that's all yeah. we know and can comment on. 
Yeah, and about phones, uh, we are sure that Samsung S23 support mm -hmm. Bluetooth LE Audio and Google Pixel. Um, and we have already tested it with Windows 11 laptop from Samsung, and we had it displayed in, um, at CES. So there are already a few devices that support. Uh, but we have another question about NRF54 series. And um, yeah. So did you jump the one on CryptoCell or? Yes. One I, can, I can buy CryptoCell. Yeah, I can just mention CryptoCell is an ARM technology. So, so it's kind of meant to, to work with uh, ARM processors. Yeah, but I think there is a bit more depth in this in that question. Maybe, maybe, but that's yeah. <laughs> based on what we got. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, about dongle version for NRF fifty four, uh, we currently have a preview development kits for both NRF fifty four H twenty and NRF fifty four L fifteen that are provided in this uh, sampling program that I described. And we, there will be something more coming, but we are not revealing it uh, yet. Uh, that's something new, NRF54H20. Does it have I2S interface? We don't have, have it on the web page, but yes, I can confirm that it will be possible to use I2S on it. Maybe so, we should just uh, say there first that a BLE matter thread is in one chip. I mean, that, that's the same radio, and I3C is a part of the 54, uh, 54H. So, uh... Yes, so only Wi Fi is in question, but yeah, we'll see. That will be the answer, maybe. Give a hint that it kind of makes sense to do it. So, yeah. Yes, <laughs> it's a very reasonable question. <laughs> yeah. So the question about a uh, sniffer for LE audio for you, Eric. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if this is specific to the NRF sniffer, which is kind of a tool that we have developed and I'm quite sure it's not in there, but I saw kind of shells is a software feature that this um, will be supported now on um, 5340, uh, 5283 and 820 uh, on the existing products. And also of course on the 54 series. So you can configure it in sort of a uh, sniffer mode and, and do it at the low level at least. Um, and having it a nerf sniffer, yeah, could be something to consider when we when we get to update it. Yeah, but currently it's not supported in in sniffer yeah. up. Um, and no, it has the old uh, uh, older stack, so it's not in there. So so this is um, it, it came uh, Sysbis came in. Um, the last this has to get experimental, so uh, and yeah, will stream be in production. That's the best we can do now. Uh, what is the NVM technology? So uh, maybe the slides weren't that clear. Uh, if that's the case, sorry. But NVM is just a term for non-volatile memory in general. So it includes flash, for example. And in NRF54 series, we're going to have a different, something different than flash. And we haven't revealed it yet. Therefore, uh, I used NVM term there. Uh, device tracking application. So yeah, we can stay here a bit longer. Mm -hmm. So it depends uh, what accuracy is needed, whether it's RSSI, then probably any thing that fits. And if you will need more accuracy, then then uh, angle of arrival is necessary direction finding. Eric, do you remember which uh, chip support direction finding? I don't have it from the top. Uh, it's 52833, which has kind of complete support with the software and can be supporting the solution. So yeah. Yeah, and there is also channel sounding coming this year. Also uh, quite interesting uh, for, for device tracking. Yes. We yeah, also have the distance toolbox, which is a distance measuring tool, uh, Nordic proprietary. That's available also. Yeah. So next question about when will NRF 53 be supported in VS Code? So actually it is supported in VS Code. So uh, the DK and audio DK is supported. So it's like 
fully possible to build applications, Flash, Debug, and, and so on. But uh, for Thingy53, uh, which doesn't contain the debugger on board, so it's still needed to build the application in VS Code and use the programmer app from NRF Connect for desktop to to download it and for debug and for debugging uh, external uh, debugger is necessary. Okay, uh, why the bare metal consumption is so much? Uh, there is a link in the chat for the DevZone blog. There is more explanation. Of course, it is possible to uh, like take the bare metal approach to the extreme, strip it down and uh, remove everything that's possible uh, with uh, soft device uh, uh, stack. We've had it not so uh, modular, so it wasn't possible to uh, disable Bluetooth features that weren't necessary. Maybe that's why it's slightly more. But uh, well, this experiment is just an example. And in, in real life, you'll probably have larger application in most cases. Uh, partner programs. Eric, can you describe some? Uh... Yes, I mean, we can talk about this forever, but just shortly, there's kind of, uh, there's uh, design partners we have, which can do R&D services and design um, solutions. Uh, so if you need help to design a product, you can address them. And then a solution partner, which has more like, I would say, perhaps a cloud solution and their own hardware. So uh, if you want to use Nordic for a specific solution, that might uh, partner might have it ready. Um, so partner cover programs, we try to sort of cover various regions and different skill sets. And we have sort of criteria to enter the partner program. So you know that the, 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 the services that provide have a certain level of quality and they know Nordic. So um, yeah, I just uh, I suggest you go, if you look at the pages, you kind of, See, see what's being offered and, and so on. And if you want to join, then you can reach out to us. Yeah, I'll take the next one. Also for you? Yeah, I think there are there are examples in SDK for this, and they, it's, uh, it's a feature that's supported on all, all 52 parts. So yeah, try, try out examples. And if, uh, if you need more help, uh, go to DevSon. Oh, question about mobile applications. I think neither of us is an expert in mobile applications. No, but uh, it's, it's, a, it's simple. We provide source code and ID is uh, the idea of your choice. Uh, it's not, uh, we don't, I don't think we impose anything here, so. Uh, but uh, one information that I have and can be interesting in, in this context, uh, BLE library for Android has been ported to Kotlin recently. NPM 1300EK. Uh, that, I don't know, and uh, it's not really a Bluetooth question. So, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, I would say that it has been released, but uh, yeah. yeah, please check I... our webpage. Uh, if it will be, this information will be there if it's already released. I think we're sampling uh, already at least. So, yeah. will it be possible to achieve more than two megabits per second? Uh, this is the maximum that's currently specified in five Bluetooth, the Bluetooth standard. Uh, we have a four megabit per second mode in uh, in the fifty four series, but that's well, that's kind of a proprietary mode. There is also some. Uh, we cannot really comment on that, but there is some some uh, talk about increasing it. So, but currently no. Any plans to see I th I three C bus introduced in an RF fifty four series? Uh, yeah, we have IP now, so probably in the future chips there will be I three C also. Yeah. 
Yes. Kind of exchange as an application, yes. Uh, profiles uh, depends on if you do, if you mean the Bluetooth profiles. Uh, yes, you are allowed to make changes, but you also have to make sure they uh, they still comply to the spec. Uh, and the profile tuning suit lets you test that. So, uh, but yeah, you get the source code and can can do changes. Yes. So at this layer, it's possible to change anything basically. But yeah. still, it have to meet the specs to be to to go through qualification. Then, if it's Bluetooth, yeah. yeah. Are we going to have any hands-on workshops coming up? Uh, not very soon, but there will be next uh, round of Nordic Tech Tour, and we're discussing the program uh, now. So maybe, but it's not decided yet. Um, so it's kind of tricky with AOA because it's more antenna dependent. Uh, so to have a complete AOA solution, it's necessary to have the algorithm. That I is see this also, if you see the next antenna. question, this next question is related and I can comment a bit on those together. Oh, yeah. So the first question is, this one and another is for the development kit about AOA and AOD. Yeah, uh, yeah. So the SDK contains uh, some like software samples. Uh, if you want the development kit, the complete solution, you need uh, hardware, which is uh, well located as multiple antennas, and uh, uh, to actually get the the angle, you need uh, algorithm, which is kind of tied to to the board, and it's quite complicated. So. Um, there we have to rely on partners. So if you go to this uh, partner page that we talked about earlier, there are some uh, partners who have competence in this. Uh, at least Ublox is the one that I first come to mind, and I think there's a few others. Um, I, yeah, I can. Um, yeah, so there are a few others so that have hardware designs and 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 can support you on this. So that's the place to go. AOD, there is not much yet, and it's uh, kind of. I think the idea there was that you would use the phone, and it's not really supported in the phones. So uh, there is a partner webinar with Ublox, and there, this is it, it's described in details. Uh, so I can I can recommend it. Um, and the last question about physical hardware for an NRF uh, desktop. Uh, so uh, there isn't a specific hardware for NRF uh, Connect for desktop. Uh, no, it's not Connect. It's NRF desktop, and it's a uh, how do you say? Ah, it? yeah, it's, it's a dong dongle keyboard, mouse, and gaming mouse. Yeah, the sample application. Yeah, All right. Yes. It's not uh, as far as I know. It's not available through distribution, but you can. It's possible to get a hold of it if you contact us and have a want to be in that business. So. So what are the main changes, features, improvements of the fourth generation radio used in NRF 54? Mm, there are improvements in performance uh, with improved maximum TX power and sensitivity. Uh, this results in longer range, uh, better robustness of the link and so on. And also radio in 54H20 and NRF 54L15 uh, consumes less power compared to 52 and 53 series. Can just uh, should I comment on the thing? Of course. Yeah, yeah. So 54H has actually down to minus 100 dBm, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, to comparison, uh, 52 series was min minus 96, not minus 97, uh, depending on on which part. So uh, and the last dBm cost quite a lot, but they make a difference. Yeah, um, it looks yeah. Uh, tiny compared to 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah. makes a difference. Yeah. Yes, and also 54H is uh, up to 10 dBm, which is kind of the maximum you can use on in a global use case that will cover that will be accepted in all, all regions. And you, if you, if you have front end module, you can go up to 20. Okay, it's about uh, the power consumption of an 54H20. Uh, so unfortunately, we are not revealing this publicly yet, but you can reach out to our sales representative to ask this about under NDA. Uh, 
One more question about NRF54. Mm, how to choose between NRF54H and NRF54L series? Uh, it depends on your needs. Basically, if you're aware of our current portfolio and you'd normally choose NRF52 series, then NRF54L is the way to go, as it's the next generation single processor, uh, tiny and ultra low power boot of SLC from us. Uh, but you can also consider how much processing power you need. Mm, in case if your application is processing hungry and you might consider using a general purpose MCU, for example, and with a small BLE chip aside, then 54H20 is the right choice. So it depends on your application and on the features and processing power that you need. Next question about about uh, how about programming languages? I can answer that one maybe. Sure. So the SDK is implemented in C and all the examples are in C. So if you talk about starting, yes, I would say definitely C. Uh, we have many customers use also C++. Uh, and if you see a benefit in that, uh, that's also possible. Uh, very typically the C++ is used when you have already have existing C++ library and you just want to integrate them. But that, that's possible. Uh, Python is also technically possible, but uh, you need sort of a runtime on it that will cost in memory size, and you will also it will also not be as power efficient. Uh, I know, for example, Circuit Python is a popular uh, runtime that you can use uh, to run Python code, but it's uh, I heard from the maintainers that it's um, for power consumption has never been sort of a design goal for it. So, yeah, it's 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 C or C plus plus basically that you should care about. So, uh, would you like to take this, these questions? I can take it too. I, I can also say uh, it's sure. uh, like the, the battery level is made, um, it's an ADC uh, peripheral that is uh, used to, to, to sort of decide on it, and there's a library inside the, the code. So, that's kind of where you see it on target. But I think the easiest way, like maybe it's also a way to, to, to interpret the question, is that uh, there is an app accompanying app, and then uh, there you can also see the level. So, that's probably the easy way. But if you want to go on the device, it's the ADC peripheral. Uh, are NR NRF53 and NRF54 pin compatible? And the simple answer is no. These are different parts with different pin out. So uh, definitely not. Do you know which one it is? Uh, unfortunately not. We'll <laughs> have to look into this and uh, there... Uh, and so we maybe have, we can uh, answer in the afternoon. I mean, locationing is a bit, uh, how to say, uh, the different solutions. So I'm sure we have, there is a beaconing app. You can have a beacon and uh, you can scan for beacons. Uh, that's also something you support in the Bluetooth mesh solution. Uh, and then we have also samples for uh, angle of arrival, so a locator and, and, and a tag. So that, that's, uh, that's part of the, the SDK. Can we answer this one? Uh, I'm not aware of any specific documentation on it, and it's usually not so different to how to say how to use C++ code with the with the C compiler. Like it's nothing. I don't think there's anything special with our solution in that sense, or different from Zephyr. Oh, uh, uh... But I mean, normally you get. If you go to devs one, you get help there, and uh, there's probably also lots of questions that are on on this that are already answered. So, okay, and and I got a hint uh, from Ali, who is our uh, expert on Zephyr, and uh, he says that uh, C plus plus language support uh, is explained in Zephyr documentation. Yeah, so okay, there, yeah, there so is that's... a place to. Yeah, to, so that's where you go, it. basically. And I think, yeah, if you go to the Zephyr documentation, which also is embedded in the NCS, NCS documentation, you just search for C++ and you'll find a page. Oh, and, and I see that uh, samples uh, for Matter are written in C++, so they that's can right. be used as a reference. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and we'll take one more question that just pop, and then we'll be wrapping up. Uh, so more details about uh, RISC V coprocessors. So uh, RISC V coprocessors in NRF54 series are 
serve a coprocessor role. Uh, so for NRL50, for L15, it's purely software-defined peripheral that will provide uh, firmware 4. And with NRL50 for H20, it, there is more freedom. There are two uh, aligned to different speeds of peripherals, and this will be programmable. All right, uh, so let's wrap up. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and for your time. Eric, thanks for participating in Q&A. My pleasure. Yeah.